Hi, I'm Julian Frost, N3JF, and in this video, I'm going to show you how to install, configure, and use the ICOM RSBA1 remote control software and your USB equipped ICOM radio. This software lets you control a remote ICOM radio installed in another area of your house or in another part of the world. So let's get going. I know you're just dying to connect your radio to your computer, but stop, don't do it. You have to install some drivers first and do a few other preparatory things. So it's really important that you avoid the temptation to hook the radio up to the computer for just a few more minutes. The only physical items you'll need to operate your ICOM radio remotely, other than your computers, are the RSBA1 software and a good USB cable, preferably one with RF chokes installed. You'll also need speakers and a microphone that are compatible with your computer or a USB headset. If you already have a headset and have it working on your computer, you're already ahead of the curve. I'm using a good quality shotgun microphone which connects to my computer via a tube amplifier, which in turn outputs its signal to a computer via a USB cable. But I only use those because I already have them for other purposes. A headset does just as well. Before we get started, it's important to cover a few basic terms as it can get quite confusing. ICOM uses the term base station, remote station, remote utility, and remote control. As we get into the configuration of the software, some of these terms may sound counterintuitive, so let's make sure we're clear about what each means. Your ICOM radio will always be physically attached to the base station computer. The base station computer and radio will ultimately be located at a distant location, be that in another area of your home or somewhere across the world. The computer at your home, with its attached speakers and microphone, is called the remote station. Think of it this way, you will be controlling the distant radio remotely, so you will be sitting at the remote station. The remote utility is used to send data to the base station computer and to receive data from the distant base station computer. It does this via a home network or via the internet. The remote control software is the graphical user interface that allows you to interact with the distant radio, as if you were actually sitting in front of it, pushing buttons and spinning dials. Sometimes it can be confusing when you think of the remote station as being the computer that you are sitting in front of, so I'll do my best to also include the word distant to help clarify which computer I'm really talking about. Before we get into the nitty gritty of the installation, I should make it clear that this tutorial will not be discussing how to set up your microphone and speakers, as there are simply too many different types to cover. Later in the video, you may see settings where the microphone and speakers are set as default device, speakers, or USB audio codec. These settings cause the software to use whichever microphone or speaker system that Windows is using as its default. You should ensure that you select the appropriate speakers and microphone settings for your particular installation. Finally, while this video covers the installation, configuration, and use of the RSBA1 software with ICOM radios with built-in USB ports, namely the IC7600, IC7410, IC7100, IC9100, and IC7200, it should also provide some help for those with ICOM radios that use an RS-232C, an SP-DIF, or accessory cable. If you have the latest firmware updates in your IC7851, IC7850, IC7800, or IC7700, then the base station configuration is done inside the radio, but the steps are essentially the same. Links to all the web pages used in this video will be provided at the end of this tutorial. So enough talk, let's do the installation. Start by creating a new folder on your desktop, just for the items you will download from the ICOM website. Call it ICOM Downloads. Regardless of which version of the RSBA1 software you have on CD, go to the ICOM website and download the latest update.
Near the very bottom of this list is the RSBA1 software update. At the time this video was made, version 1.70 is the latest version, so click the Control Software version 1.70 link. Scroll to the bottom of the page and click on the Agree button. Download the update to the ICOM Downloads folder on your desktop. This page also has links to the newest USB drivers and the RSBA1 manuals, which we'll need in the next steps. Click on the link to the latest USB driver, and a new browser window opens, showing you the USB driver download page. Scroll down the page and click on the Agree button to download the driver to the folder on your desktop. After the driver has been successfully downloaded, close the browser window and go back to the RSBA1 software update window you were looking at before. You should download the manuals for the RSBA1 software by following the RSBA1 link here. When you click on a specific manual and click the Accept button, the manual will open in Adobe Reader. You can save the manual by pressing the disk icon here. I recommend you download all the manuals that are relevant for your particular installation. Close your web browser and open the folder where you downloaded the RSBA1 software update, the USB drivers, and the manuals. The driver file you downloaded is a zip file containing several other files. Depending on how you have Windows configured, you may or may not see the .zip file extension. The files inside the zip file must be extracted before they can be installed. Double-click the driver zip file to open it. Click once on the CD3015010003 folder and drag it to the desktop. This will automatically decompress the archive as it copies to the desktop. Double-click it. Double-click the drivers folder. Double-click the CP210XVCP installer x64.exe file and follow the prompts to install the driver. Close the folder when the installation is complete. Now you'll install the RSBA1 software that you got on CD. Insert your RSBA1 installation CD and open the drive to see the files contained on the CD. Open the RSBA1 folder by double-clicking on it. Double-click the setup.exe file. Follow the prompts and enter your name and company. I use my call sign for the company. Enter the product ID and serial number from the CD's dual case. After the software has been installed, close the CD-ROM folder. You must now update the RSBA1 software you just installed from CD. To do this, go into the ICOM Downloads folder on your desktop again. Double-click on the rsba one upver 170zip file. Click once on the rsba one upver 170 folder and drag it to the desktop. Double-click on this folder to open it. Double-click the update.exe file to run the update and follow the prompts.
Now we have to configure the Windows Firewall. Click the Start button and type the word Firewall. Click the item in the list that says Allow a program through Windows Firewall. Click Change Settings. Click Allow Another Program. Scroll down to Remote Utility. Click Add. Click OK. Windows will now allow access to the RSBA1 software from the Internet and will allow the software to send data back out to the Internet. By default, most routers block the kind of access that the RSBA1 software needs, so we need to open some ports into the router and point these access routes to the computer that's running the RSBA1 software. Click the Windows Start button and type the letters CMD and then press the Enter key. Expand the command prompt window and then type ipconfig a space, a forward slash, and the word all, and press the enter key. Make a note of the IP address on the line that says IPv4 address. For me, my computer's IP address on my home network is 192.168.1.15. My router is configured to always make sure my computer gets the same IP address on my home network. And I recommend you configure yours the same. Close the command prompt window. Now you can forward the ports on your router to the computer running the RSBA1 software. Using a web browser, connect to your router. Most routers are accessed by typing in their IP address into the web browser's address bar, and most use the IP address 192.168.1.1. If this address doesn't work for you, you'll need to refer to your router's manual to get the proper IP address for your specific router. Sometimes it's actually printed on the back of the router. Log into the router as its administrator and find the port forwarding section. Unfortunately, the manufacturers of the various routers all use different terminology. Some use port forwarding and others, like my Belkin router, use terms like virtual servers. If you see a section with the heading Firewall, it's a good idea to look in there. You'll need to open three UDP ports on your router, specifically ports 5001, 5002, and 5003, and point them to the IP address of the computer that's running the RSBA1 software. On most routers with up-to-date firmware, you can simply tell the router to open a range of UDP ports like this. Type in a description for the port, such as RSBA1. Type in the starting port, 5001. Type in the ending port, 5003. Specify that it's a UDP port. And give the router the IP address of the computer running the RSBA1 software, in my case 192.168.1.15 and then tell it which ports to use on that computer, that is 5001 through 5003. But of course, that didn't work on my router. On my router, specifying a range of ports 5001 through 5003 didn't work, so I had to enter them individually as you see here. It does the same thing, it's just not as tidy as entering everything on one line. And don't forget to save your changes. When accessing the distant base station computer, the one that's connected to your radio, from anywhere outside your home, you'll need to tell the RSBA1 controlling software the IP address of the distant base station computer.
for example, 68.4.200.19. The IP address is a bit like the computer's phone number, and without knowing it, you can't call the distant computer. In a perfect world, that IP address or phone number would never change. However, most internet service providers, or ISPs, regularly change the external IP address or the phone number assigned to their customers, unless that customer pays an extra fee for a static IP address. What this means to users of the RSBA1 system is that you may be able to connect to your distant base station computer and radio for days, weeks, months, or even years, and then suddenly you won't be able to connect to it at all because your ISP has changed the network IP address to the distant base station computer that's running the radio. This is clearly very annoying, and if it happened, you'd have to do some detective work to find out the distant base station computer's new IP address and reconfigure the RSBA1 software to access it again. So if, like most people, your ISP assigns you a dynamic IP address, one that the ISP can change at any time, you'll need to subscribe to a DDNS, or Dynamic Domain Name Server service. A DDNS service assigns you a domain name on their servers, which is constantly updated to point to your base station computer's IP address, even if your ISP changes it. So instead of configuring the RSBA1 software to connect to a specific fixed numerical IP address, like 68.4.200.19, which could regularly change, you configure it to look at the DDNS name, something like myrsba1.ddns.com, and the DDNS service makes sure that it always points to your computer. Two DDNS services that I've had experience with are dyn.com, which charges a yearly fee for its service, and noip.com, which is free. There are many other DDNS services available, and you should research what each service offers and look for reviews on each before subscribing to one. After signing up with your chosen DDNS service, You'll configure your router to regularly update the DDNS service with its new IP address whenever it changes. Let's assume that you've signed up to use the dyn.com DDNS service and that you have chosen the domain name rsba1 on their dyndns-remote.com domain. If your router supports dynamic domain name server updating for the dyn DDNS service, you would enter this information into your router, along with your username and password for the DYN DDNS service. If your router doesn't support automatic DDNS updating, or doesn't natively support the service you've chosen, you can download a small program from your chosen DDNS service that'll constantly run on the distant base station computer, and every time your ISP changes its IP address, it'll update your DDNS service with the changes. The next step is to physically connect your radio to the distant base station computer. Use a well-shielded USB cable and connect the radio to your computer. Once Windows has recognized the radio, double-click on the RSBA1 remote utility application. You'll be asked to set your own PC information. Press OK and enter a unique name for your PC. For this installation, I'll use N3JF Remote. Double check that the ports listed in the boxes match the ports you opened in your router. Select your network connection type, either fiber to the home or FTTH, or ADSL slash cable TV. I found that FTTH always works for me, even though my ISP is a cable TV provider. So I select FTTH. If you have trouble connecting to your remote station, you can try changing to ADSL slash CATV. You'll need to quit the remote utility and restart it for the changes to take effect. Next, we'll add a user. Open the user list screen by going to the server settings drop-down menu. Enter a user ID. For example, I'm going to add a user with my own call sign, N3JF. Enter a password for this user. If you want to give this user administrator rights, 
click the administrator box. Click add to save the settings. The user registration screen appears which allows you to select which radio the user may access. We haven't set up the radio yet so just press OK for now. Now we'll add a radio. With the server setting drop down list still selected, select the radio list tab. Click add. Enter a name for the radio. I'm using an IC7100 so I'll use that for the radio name. I'll need the radio's CIV's address and the board rate so I'll go to the radio and press the set button. Then scroll down and press the connectors option. I'll scroll down to CIV and select it. Here I can see that the radio's board rate is 19200 and the CIV address is 88H. Your settings may be different, but use whatever settings are in your radio for the upcoming steps. In the remote utility, enter the CIV address, just the number, and make sure the board rate matches what was in your radio, in my case 19200. Check the public box to allow outside connections. You'll need to do this if you want to be able to use the radio remotely. Click on user permission. This will open the list of user accounts that you've created. Select the user who you want to be able to access this radio and click on permit. Click OK to finish. If you have a fast internet connection, you can allow the remote user to adjust the sample rates for the audio from the radio and the microphone for higher quality. Keeping the check mark in these two boxes allows the remote user to adjust the audio quality up to these predetermined limits. I suggest leaving them at their defaults for now. You can always adjust them later. The COM port should be determined automatically, but if it is not, you have the option of going to the Windows Device Manager to locate the correct COM port and enter it in here. In this case, the remote utility has found the correct COM port, so I can leave it selected as auto. Click OK. Now that you've created a user account and configured your radio, you can check that you can connect to the radio and hear it through your computer speakers. First, make sure your radio is turned on. Click on the drop down menu at the top of the remote utilities window and select radio operation. Make sure the radio you entered is highlighted. Click the settings button to select different microphones or speaker systems from those available on your system. Save any changes you made. Click Connect. You should hear your radio come to life. Click the AF button to adjust the audio level from the radio to your speakers or headset. Click the MOD button to adjust the audio gain from the microphone to the radio. Click disconnect to close the connection to the radio. Congratulations, you've successfully made a working connection from your distant base station computer to your radio. You can now use the ICOM RSBA1 remote control application to provide a digital interface to the radio that is physically connected to your computer via the USB cable. Let's configure the remote control application so we can test the computer to radio connection. First close down the remote utility as we don't actually need it to use the remote controller to access a radio that's physically attached to this computer. Next double click on the remote control application to start it. Click Options and then Connect Settings. In the pull down menu, select the type of radio you're using. In this case, it's the IC7100. We're connecting to the radio via the USB cable, so leave the connection as USB. We're not using the remote utility, so use that setting as Not Use. If the COM port setting didn't automatically populate it, 
set it to the same COM port you used earlier when you set up the remote utility. In my case it's COM11. Check that the baud rate is correct, 19200 in this installation, and change the CIV number if necessary. It's 88 in this instance. Select your speaker system from the pull down list for the voice memory section. If you want the remote controller to turn off the radio when you exit the program, put a check mark in the software closing turns off the radio box. Click the OK button. Click OK to finish. Now power on the radio by clicking on the RSBA1 remote control power button. Your radio should turn on and you can use the remote control program to interact with it. Let's explore some of the features of the remote control software. Click the preamp button to cycle through the preamp settings. Click the attenuator to enable and disable the attenuators. Cycle through slow, medium and fast AGC circuits. Try out the noise blanker and noise reduction systems. You adjust the settings from their operation panel in the view menu. Change bands using the dedicated band switch buttons on the right of the main display. Change operating modes by clicking on the buttons underneath the main display. Change RF power, squelch, audio gain and RF gain using the mouse buttons. Click the filter button to change filter settings and adjust the twin passband tuning dial with the mouse buttons. Use the left mouse button to step down in frequency and the right mouse button to step up in frequency. You can increase or decrease the tuning step size by clicking on the TS buttons. You've now successfully set up one half of the RSBA1 software. The good news is the other portion, the remote station setup, is relatively quick and easy. We're now shifting our attention to what ICOM calls the remote station computer. This is the computer at home that you'll be using to control the distant computer and radio. You'll need to install the USB drivers, RSBA1 software, and updates, just as you did for the distant base station computer. You will also have to configure the Windows firewall and configure the router to forward ports 5001, 5002 and 5003, just as we did on the router to which the distant base station computer is connected. There's no need to install a DDNS client as it doesn't matter if your home computer's IP address changes. Having installed the RSBA1 software and its updates, start the remote utility. You'll be asked to enter the PC information, just as you did on the base station computer. Enter a unique name for your PC, for example, N3JF Base. Check the ports listed are the same as the ports you forwarded on your router. Set the internet access line to FTTH. Click apply and restart the program. After the program starts again, click on the server list tab. 
You'll be entering the information the software needs to connect to the remote computer. Enter a server description. Again, I used N3JF base. Enter the DDNS domain name that you obtained when you subscribed to the DDNS service. The example I used earlier was rsba1.dyndns-remote.com. That isn't my real DDNS domain name. I'm keeping that secret. Enter in the username and password for the DDNS domain name. Again, I'm keeping these secret. Click OK and you'll see your server information displayed. Click once to highlight the server. You can click on the properties button should you ever need to change a setting. Click the connect button and the RSBA1 software will attempt to connect to the distant base station computer. If you see the word connecting, you've established a link. It says connecting, but it really means connected. Click the radio list tab and you'll see that the radio you configured on the distant base station computer is now listed here. Click the settings button and in the virtual COM port number field, choose a COM port that is not in use in your system. As an example, I chose COM port 8 as I know that one is free. Click save when done. Now comes the big test. With the radio highlighted, click Connect. The software confirms that it's communicating on virtual COM port number 8 and is displaying the word Connect, which again should say Connected. Start the remote controller program. You'll have to configure it to communicate through the remote utility. Click Option, then choose Connect setting. Change the model to the IC7100. Change the connection type from USB to remote. Change remote utility from not used to IC7100. The COM port and CIV address is populated automatically. Select the ICOM vAudio1 virtual driver for the audio device. Press OK and all your configuration is done. Turn on the remote radio by clicking on the remote control program's power button. After a few seconds, the display lights and you're now able to control the radio. Whiskey 7, Bravo, Foxtrot, Foxtrot, W7, BFF. Back to you next, Troll. You can switch operating modes. All right, I got it that time. Thank you. PWX, go ahead with your You can directly enter frequencies. You can change bands. And you can spin the dial, just like you could if sitting at the controls of the remote radio. When you've finished operating your distant radio, turn it off using the remote control program's power button. Close the remote control program and then disconnect from the remote computer. Well that's it for the general installation and configuration. Let's take a look at actually using the software. In the following live on-air examples, I'm operating with a vertical antenna in the middle of a condominium complex, which is hardly the best setup for good DXing. All data is being sent from my computer across the internet and back to my computer, so these examples are what you can expect to see with the RSBA1 software. In one example, you might hear a little RF distortion on the recorded audio. 
That occurred because the radio was located only about three feet from the recording computer's microphone for filming purposes. In your setup, this won't be an issue as the microphone and the radio will be separated by many feet or many miles. Here are the demonstrations. Many people use D-Star on their new D-Star capable radios. It's easy to operate through a D-Star repeater using the RSBA1 software. Type in the frequency, e.g. 446.560000 and press enter. Press the DV button. Press the dupe button if necessary for the correct offset. It's already set to minus in this case. Click View, then DV, and select Call Sign. To select CQ, CQ, CQ for a general call, click the CQ button. Click the Enable button to enable the RPT2 field for gateway operation. In the RPT1 box, enter the repeater call sign, for example, KJ6GRSB. In the repeater 2 box, enter the gateway call sign, for example, KJ6GRSG. Pressing the G button here automatically places the G in the 8th column. Enter or change the call sign in the My column to reflect your call sign. Click OK and the radio will be set up to use the specified repeater. Click the Transmit button and make a call. N3JF, is there anyone who can give me a quick signal report, please? Any received call signs will appear in the received call record box that automatically appears. This is Alpha Echo 7 Golf. Your signal is very strong. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. This is N3JF, and I'll be clear. To save that D-Star repeater in a memory slot, say memory number 10, use the memory up or down button to select memory number 10. Click and hold the memory right button until you hear a double beep and the VFO information is saved to memory. Now edit the memory list to add a description to the memory slot. Click the name field, type in the description and press enter. Save your changes by clicking File, then Save. Now you can see the description for memory number 10. Standard FM repeaters are easy to set up and use, as is setting up a memory. Close the digital mode related windows as you won't need them for operating on FM. Click on the main display and enter the output frequency of the repeater, for example 448.060000 and press enter to send the frequency to the radio. Click the FM button to select the FM operating mode. Press the tone slash digital squelch button to enable the repeater tone function. Press the dupe button multiple times until the correct offset is displayed. Click on the view menu item and select operating panels and choose the tone panel. Select the correct tone from the drop-down list, in this case, 100 Hz. You're ready to use the repeater, but I'm going to save it to memory slot number 1 for future use. So I repeatedly click the Memo Down button to get to slot number 1, and then click and hold the Memory Right button until I hear a double beep. To give the memory a descriptive name, click on the Memory Channel button, select Memory Channel number 1's name field, and enter in the description. Click on another field to save the changes. Here you can see that the memory channel name was updated. This is Julie in Lake Forest, California, KK6NYG. To squelch background static on FM, click on the View menu, then select Set Mode. Double click on the USB audio squelch setting and change it from off to on. You can now adjust the front panel squelch dial to close the squelch while operating on FM repeaters.
The RSBA1 software is fast enough to use for a contest. Just tune in the station and hit transmit. Julia, Julia, Mike, you fly nine kilowatts. I need to stay the state. It's Kansas, Kansas, Roger. Thank you, Hotel Kilo One Tango. Did you come this Hotel Kilo One Tango? November 3, Japan, Florida. November 3, Japan, Florida, 5-9-2. Roger, copy uh, 5-9 in California, 5-9, California. This is November 3, Japan, Florida. Roger, roger. Thanks, Hotel Kilo One Tango. Uh, the rig I'm running right now is an IC7100. It's a uh, all mode uh, HF, UHF, VHF. The software is great for rag chewing, even while using your computer for other purposes. As I'm sure you're aware. So uh, back to you, LDI. This is N3JF. All right, very good there, Julian. N3JF, WA6LDI, very good. Yes, I'm, uh, I've known about the 7100. Uh, I've never operated one. I do have an ICOM 7000, uh, the predecessor to that particular rig that I run uh, mobile with, and also have an ICOM um, 888 that I get on D-Star with. I'm a member of the PAPA system as well as Sora. In your web browser, go to hf.dstar-relay.net and log in with your call sign. You can see all the other stations currently logged in and the frequency they are tuned to. Clicking on one of the preset frequency buttons announces that you are listening for or making calls on that frequency. On the remote controller application, make sure you are on the right frequency and the DV button is pressed. You can now listen for somebody calling CQ or put out a call yourself. Nine KF zero XQ N three JF. JF 5 0 XQ. Roger, roger. Copy uh, 5 by 9 also in 3 JF. Thank you for the two way. Roger, roger. Well, that concludes this video on the RSBA1 software installation and configuration. I hope you found it helpful. I know it looks like there's a lot to do, but once you get the hang of it, it's really not that difficult and will probably take less than an hour from start to finish. Please take some time to explore the interface in detail. Don't forget to look at the various operational panels that are available in the menus. They'll make operating the radio even more efficient. For ICOM America, I'm Julian Frost, N3JF. <laughs>